Every year on October 31st, children roam the dark streets long after their bedtimes to collect candy from neighbors. From many houses, illuminated faces smile or grimace at the passers-by. This is the spooky tale of how jack-o'-lanterns came to be. <laughs> the tradition of the jack-o'-lantern originates from Ireland, where people would carve scary faces on potatoes and beets to ward off evil spirits on All Hallows' Eve, or as we know it, Halloween. After time, jack-o'-lanterns also became a symbol for the fall harvest celebration. The story of the jack-o'-lantern is part of a traditional Irish folktale. Long ago, there was a man known as Stingy Jack, who one night made a deal with the devil exchanging his soul for a few drinks at the local pub. When the devil returned to collect his dues, Jack tricked him into climbing a tree and trapped the devil by carving a cross into the tree trunk. For his freedom, the devil agreed to cancel his end of the bargain, and Jack kept his soul. Jack enjoyed a long life, but when he finally died, he was denied entrance to both heaven and hell and was doomed to wander between worlds with other lost souls. But in a rare act of kindness, the devil gave Jack a burning ember that he placed into a carved turnip to light the way. This is why the Irish called him Jack of the Lantern or Jack of the Lantern. Now it seems that everywhere you look, jack-o'-lanterns appear in the pages of popular stories like the legend of Sleepy Hollow, where a headless horseman rides at night with a jack-o'-lantern in hand. Or on your screen in classic Halloween shows like It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Jack-o'-lanterns have certainly become synonymous with Halloween and the fall season. Just as families will go on hayrides, apple bobbing, and trick-or-treating, they won't forget to indulge in the beloved tradition of pumpkin carving. Happy Halloween! Our milk is definitely different, I mean, from store-bought milk. And if you taste it, that's what the son said, you just need to get people to taste it. We milk about 136 right now dairy cows. There's 300 animals total on the farm right now with uh, the milk cows and then the young stock. So we get up at about 3.15 in the morning and we start the day with milking the cows. It takes us about three and a half hours to milk the, the 136 cows. Um, we take the fresh milk from their moms and bring it here to the greenhouse to feed the babies. They have a baby about every year to year and a half, and as long as they keep having babies, they'll keep making milk for, for their babies. We do rotational grazing, which I explained to the kids. It's basically like we give the cows a new playground every couple of days, and they go mow the lawn for us. In the milking parlor, the cows enter the milking parlor and we clean them with iodine. It's just a disinfectant. It's the same thing a doctor would use to clean your skin before surgery. It kills germs and bacteria. Then we dry her off with a washcloth and we attach the milking machine. Cows are habit. They like to do the exact same thing the exact same way every single day. Like most of the cows have a stall. Like this is, the, they're right or left handed. Like they'll only go in on this side. They normally are in the same position. They might not be in exactly the first or the, you know, but they're about the same position. They'll lay down in about the same stall. They'll eat at about the same time every day. They're, they like to do everything exactly the same. So once you get them into that routine of, hey, this is what we do every day, they, they just go right into it. We are only using about 2% of our daily production. I make about 20,000 pounds of milk every other day um, with 136 cows. So we don't use hardly any of that at the creamery at this point. 
So the rest of it we sell to a co-op, so it'll go anywhere on the eastern seaboard, depending on who needs milk at that time. Me taking care of the cows, I know every cow by looking at her spots. I can tell you her mother's name, her daughter's names, um, her sisters, and that's the, the benefit of having a small herd, that I know everybody. If we went to having 600 cows, we would still take really good care of the cows, but they would be more of a, of a number on a sheet that I was taking care of as a, as a mass group instead of being able to have that personal connection with me and the cow. It's definitely more of a lifestyle than the occupation. It's kind of one of those things we don't really know what we would do if we didn't have the cows. We have a corn maze in the fall. We do school tours in the spring and fall. Uh, have kids out do educational tours with them. We geared everything kind of towards uh, education. We want people to be able to see what we're doing and how we're doing it. Dad was on the soil conservation board for years and years and years, so any soil conservation uh, practice that was available that was shown to lessen pollution or, or be good for the environment, well, he was on top of and, and we always try to participate in that. It, it pays to be known in the community that you're doing things right. It's, it's cream line milk, which means if you let it set in the refrigerator overnight, the cream rises to the top, then you'll have a layer of cream on top. Almost all, probably all store milk is separated. They separate the cream from the skim. And then when they want whole, what they call whole milk in the store, it is skim milk with a certain amount of cream added back into it to make it the right percentage because they can't deal with whole milk from a cow because it varies too much. We also make our ice cream. Uh, we make our own mix with sugar, powdered milk, uh, stabilizer. We mix that together, pasteurize it. Then this is our batch freezer. We turn it here, we put our ingredients in, our flavorings and all. We want to get it cold really quick. We want to freeze it solid rock hard as quickly as possible to freeze those ice crystals so they don't grow. Because if you don't freeze it fast, the ice crystals keep growing and then you get a gritty taste in your ice cream. It's not smooth and creamy. We have a 10% butterfat ice cream, which is typically lower than what you will find in the store, especially for a rich, creamy ice cream because we're using a gelato machine to mix it. It's much more dense. You're getting much more product than one scoop of ice cream. It's like getting two scoops of somebody else's ice cream. One might wonder, what do refugees see upon arrival in a foreign country? Who is there to welcome them? How do refugees adjust to their new hometowns and ways of life? Aujourd'hui, le pays est malade. Today, the country is sick. Donc, comment le pays est malade, il faut soigner le pays. We have to cure, to cure the country. My name is uh, Marie-Edith Douya. I'm French and I've been living in, in uh, Paris for now maybe uh, 30 or 40 years. I don't remember exactly. And I am a member, volunteer, and in some way activist in uh, Amnesty International in Paris. And uh, on uh, another side, I uh, uh, I am a French teacher to refugees. Uh, some have, be, have a good background in their country and others have uh, never been to school and uh, they, when they are in France they learn how to speak and write French.
The world is a bright place. However, even in Paris, the renowned city of lights, this brightness is not universal. To examine the global implications of the ongoing refugee crisis firsthand, Silverlands collaborated with Amnesty International France, interacting with Parisian refugees and working to expose their plight. Hi, this is Sebastian Kraft, on location in Paris. Juxtaposition is a funny thing. Just as the ancient Louvre Art Museum is quite opposite to its more contemporary glass pyramid, Paris in itself is a very juxtaposed city, especially regarding human rights. اليوم أبل أحمد الجبر جسوي يمنت جسوي جورنالست جيت خذا السبع نيوز أجنسي دبي دوميل. زي ما بقول جيبي ماريجا مشي دموريتاني، دونك زابيت لسيد دموريتاني، أم فاس سينغال وفلوف. مشي أربي أم فرانس، لو 20 أكتوبر. J'ai sorti Yémen en 2015, après l'Arabie Saoudi attaque au Yémen. J'ai fait un demande d'asile, mais le Doban n'a pas été marché. Donc bientôt, je suis là, 9 ans. Speaking to Silverlands in French and in the vicinity of a Parisian mosque, Ahmed Al Jabra describes his habit of waiting in line, rain or shine, for new documentation, symbolizing his transition from Yemeni journalist to full-time refugee. Parfois il fait bleu, parfois il fait froid, parfois il fait chaud. C'est très très mal. C'est très mal. La fin, c'est réfugié. Pas journaliste. Maintenant, il est toi réfugié. Moi, je suis réfugié. Non, journaliste. While Al Jabra was forced to abandon his former life through habit, GB Marega, on the other hand, was stripped of his native citizenship. I am here without any nationality. 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 I am I went to the embassy, to the Mauritanian embassy, to renew my passport, and there was no way to obtain anything. Marega is currently a citizen of no nation, and he is applying for, but is not guaranteed, the official status of stateless person. The dictator has not understood. He has taken his choice, so the choice is very hard to say, the dictator in Mauritania made his choice, and it is very difficult for us in, in uh, for us Negro Mauritanians. Donc même je connais un monsieur, il est il est malade, transmet qu'on a le monsieur l'on a arrêté, torturé, et mis en prison. Tu vois c'est parce que sous le faisceau. Donc le on met le on met dans là comme ça. Silverland spoke with Amnesty International, which assists refugees and migrants such as Algebra and Marega in their pursuit of their papers. At Amnesty International headquarters, we, we do not uh, make any selection um, between nationalities. We just uh, try to um, answer questions that for people coming here and asking legal advices and we provide them with legal information and help them to apply for asylum correctly in France. Ultimately, one might wonder, what does it mean to be a humanitarian? What can we all do to help better the world? How does Paris relate back to our local community? If I may let let me tell you a story uh, told by a French Algerian philosopher called Pierre Rabhi. It's a story of a colibri. That's a tiny bird. 
And in the jungle, there was a big fire, a big, big fire. And the colibri, he took one drop of water and put it on the fire. And he did that again, again, and again. And the lion looked at him and said, why are you doing that? Don't you think it's too small for, to do that? And the colibri said, no, I am just doing my part. I will say I've never met a flower I didn't like. I feel like they're always smiling at you. I just always have been enamored with them. Really, since before I could even talk, my parents had said I was always running towards flowers, so I always liked them. My name is Sarah Von Polaro and I'm a floral designer. So Urban Petals is a floral design company and we create flower arrangements and specifically floral designs actually for very large events and then we donate them afterwards to nonprofit organizations. We do flowers at the State Department, we've done flowers at multiple embassies, a lot of the big museums. One of my proudest moments has, has been doing the flowers at the Kennedy Center, which has been so exciting. I always loved arranging flowers my whole life. I started when I was about three years old with my grandmother, and then when I was in college, I apprenticed with some master floral designers and then decided to start my business a few years later after I graduated. I decided to, to start Urban Petals at that time, not because I had a lot of business background, but because I wanted to do my sort of creative passion full time and thought, well, I'll just try it, you know, and see what happens. I was working in the nonprofit field, doing flowers on the side, and it, it was becoming like I said, it was always a hobby, but it was becoming a bigger thing all the time. Every weekend I was doing flowers for someone and I thought, finally thought, gosh, this is so big. Maybe I should start a business. One of the biggest things is people say, how did you know how to do that? How did you, you know, start in the notion of, did you have all this business experience? No, I was 25 and I took safe risks in that. I thought, why don't we try it? We'll have a website, we'll see what happens. And I still was working on another job on the side and then it slowly took off. It's grown to be a very, a big thing and we've taken on very large orders, which I'm proud of our team for handling. One thing that's exciting is as a female business owner, there are a lot of resources out there for other women owned businesses and it's been neat to connect with those um, resources and then also find mentors in the field so that I can learn from, from other women who've done it before. Typically after events and we have, you know, tons of flowers in vases or extra buckets of flowers, we sometimes do an outright donation where we might just take those vases of flowers over to a nonprofit organization, place them all out over their facility so they have beautiful flower arrangements brightening their space. And other times we'll actually go in, take apart the flower arrangements, plan, pre-plan a sort of flower arranging experience for the residents or the clients. And then I will teach large groups of people how to arrange flowers. They'll make their own arrangement with those flowers and then get to keep those.
Sometimes I say I think they turn the lights on in other people. It's like bringing in joy into someone's home or, or space. They can bring things to life. And so I think when people have flowers in their home and in their spaces that it's, it's, a, it's a lively experience and, and it makes things a little bit brighter for, for them. I believe that you can make your passion your life's work. So that's what I've been lucky enough to do is to take my creative thing, making flower arrangements, the same way someone might be an artist in a different fashion, and turn it into a business. And I'll tell you, it makes you very happy. It's not easy, but it's quite fulfilling. It's as close as I ever came to being really obnoxious of taking and putting a trash can on the table at Blair and taking the IEP and putting it in there and setting it on fire. I mean, that's what it was worth, zero. Montgomery County Public Schools, population 153,852. 16,462 of these students receive special education services about 10.7%. MCPS has two directions, a 504 plan or an IEP. So an IEP is an individualized education plan and it's developed for students that need um, extra support in one or another area. Um, I used to, or I still sometimes I'll read a sentence and it just doesn't make sense at all and I'll have to go over it again. And the IEP gave me extended time so I didn't have to like rush through paperwork or anything and I could read it over and it was much clearer for me. You can get preferential seating, you can get more time on assignments and get notes from teachers and like type things that should be written. A 504 is a non-permanent plan to help with any setback from a broken arm to a short attention span. Alternatively, an IEP is a plan with set protocols to help a student through their academic career. IEPs have strict guidelines that must be followed by counselors and teachers, but a 504 still has legal ramifications if the student's needs are not met. When you deal with 150 students per day, um, it's difficult to remember which 12 have accommodations and what those specific accommodations are. They weren't helping me as it was legally required. The teachers have been you know, really interested in accommodating and, and reaching our students and including them in their classes. I have a great staff here. They're, they're wonderful. I would not trade them for the world. Um, and they all work very hard and they all are good at their job. And um, they teach me things, I teach them things. Um, but uh, I think they do an outstanding job in providing supports for, for our kids. Autism Resource Services is a program for students who are higher functioning on the autism spectrum, housed in a comprehensive middle school. You address the foundational skills that are necessary in order to produce handwriting. So when if there's a child who has low tone and doesn't have endurance, if you build the endurance, they'll be able to write for longer periods of time. What she needed was so simple that it was, it was amazing to me that they couldn't provide it. I chose MCPS and I've stayed with MCPS because I really do think that uh, as a school system, we really work really hard to address our students' needs. Yeah, I think MCPS does an outstanding job. Um, the districts that I've worked in before, I don't think had a system quite like this one here, so I, I really see it as a great system and very helpful. I think the desire to provide the best for every student is there. I just don't know that the resources and manpower is there. MCPS tries very, very hard to, to help each and every student be successful. And that's one of the reasons why I'm proud to work for MCPS. I think it's been fairly hindering. It's not set up in a helpful way and no one consistently follows it. Each teacher and counselor administrator 
kind of has their own guidelines as to how they'll follow it. And if what's available isn't what you need, then you're out of luck and you have to make do with what you get. It happens sometimes we call in uh, some outside services uh, from central office to come and support us. Maybe they do an observation uh, and then they give us some different strategies to work, uh, work with students with. Yeah. MCPS recently launched a new online portal this year that lays out specific accommodations for each student and eliminates the subjective interpretation for what these accommodations mean. I still had to go through all the hoops of getting him tested, which took at least two months and it's fairly expensive. Um, the county didn't do the testing for him, so. I've had a few negative experiences. Um, two of them that really stick out are a Spanish class and an English class I had my sophomore year. The teachers did not help me make up work. They helped me to send expectations as other students, even when I wasn't physically capable. Well, sure. I mean, that is actually one of the issues for most of our students is difficulty self-advocating. Like, it gets done if I ask about it and persist, but like, if you didn't and you didn't go straight up to your teacher and tell them what you had and what you needed, it would take a long time. If a parent is willing to fight for their kid and knows and understands what is going on, they have a better chance of getting things to work for their children. But many parents either do not have the time, do not speak English, find school meetings intimidating, or don't know how to maneuver the system. Those kids are at a real deficit in having their needs met, and that is a real problem. Whether people bike because of the affordability or efficiency, biking as a form of transportation has become an enticing alternative to driving. It's an easy way to exercise and helps the environment, overall making it very convenient to use in urban areas like D.C. and Montgomery County. It kind of gives, gives people the freedom to set their own schedule, so they're not tied to the uh, public transit schedule, and, they're not, and, uh, and, then, and then you can also you know, just avoid all the traffic. Uh, when I first moved to Washington um, and I lived in the region, biking was really not a popular transportation choice. Back in the like two, year 2000, we had about 1% of the people bicycling, bicycling to work. Now it's over 4%. It's a great complement to transit and to walking. And so, um, you know, in, a, in an urban environment, it can be, you know, one of the three or four main ways people get around, and I think that's great. The rise in bike sharing programs in metropolitan DC and the surrounding area has aided the increasing interest in biking. Programs like Capital Bike Share allow DC residents to pick up a bicycle from any of the numerous docking stations. People without easy access to a personal bike can pick a docking station, take a bike, and return it anywhere else in the city. I saw the introduction of bike share in downtown DC, which really was kind of a symbol of change in people's uh, preferences about how they would move around the city. And when Capital Bike Share opened, suddenly there were thousands of people on these bright red bikes everywhere, and you couldn't pretend like you didn't see them. Our Capital Bike Share is one of the oldest um, systems in the country. Uh, and it's been proven to be quite a success as far as transit systems go. It's a really visible way to uh, increase the viability of biking for transportation. Despite the many benefits to biking, cyclists are more vulnerable in urban areas. Densely populated cities mean more foot traffic in cars, and bikers have minimal protection. This lack of safety prevents many additional people from choosing to bike. So the rules of the road are, in DC and virtually everywhere else, is that bikes, bikes are allowed to be in the road and use the road. Um, and that's fine on a lot of streets, but as the traffic gets higher and the speeds get higher, people don't feel comfortable on the streets. So a lot of people, you know, are, are just too afraid to ride on the streets with cars. It's just, it's just too, too dangerous and too scary, and, and that's, that's a big concern. On a bike, um, you certainly feel more vulnerable. Um, 
by and large, you're not really in any more, like statistically, at any more risk of, of getting hurt than you are when you're driving. But, you know, people need to feel safe. That's that's kind of the big issue that's been holding back a lot of people from biking. They they know it's good for them. They know it's good for uh, our the world that we live in. Uh, but, you know, people don't want to do that if, it, if they feel that, that their safety is in jeopardy. So that's really an area we're trying to work on. The development of bike lanes in the urban area curbs safety hazards and invites bikers to share the road. By providing a simple barrier between bikers and motorists, bike lanes allow people uncomfortable with biking on crowded city streets to enjoy biking while still feeling safe. Every time they build, you know, more bike lanes or more bike paths and trails, um, you know, that, that helps a lot. Um, making sure that people on bikes have low stress places to ride. Um, sometimes that's as simple as a painted bike lane. Often that means um, a protected bike lane, which is something that's got either uh, uh, plastic posts or a concrete curb or uh, some trees or bushes that separate you from, um, physically separate you from moving traffic. Lots of times it can be a row of parking. So instead of having the car lane, bike lane, and parking, you move the parking over into the bike lane between the curb and the parking. When you build this kind of bike infrastructure, uh, protected bike lanes they're called, that a lot of people begin to bike who otherwise wouldn't bike. So we're trying to make areas, whether it's painted bike lanes or separated bike lanes and trails where they'll feel more comfortable. You know, it makes people feel more comfortable and makes them feel like that's a possibility for them that they could choose to do that. It, the people who want to ride bikes that feel like they can't, and that's the real problem that needs to be solved. So, Anything that makes that easier for people, it's great. We need to make bike facilities that are um, easier to use and people feel more comfortable in them and they know where they're supposed to be. Biking has readily become a key aspect of transportation in the DC metro area. Even though biking as a transportation introduces certain safety challenges, which deters possible riders, the increase in services like bike lanes or bike sharing have made cycling an easier way to get around the city. I ride to work almost every day, um, one because I enjoy it, but also because it actually takes less time. Like walking seems kind of too slow, and driving or taking a bus is sometimes too fast, but, um, but biking is just the right speed, so it's just a more enjoyable way to get around in a lot of cases. The FCC put out a call for applications for low-power FM stations. And low-power FM stations are meant to be purposefully short radius of range so that it is meant to be more focused on building community. So everything that we do is primarily volunteer-based and all the programmers are here on their own time. They have families, you know, jobs, other things going on, but they take time out of their week to prepare shows and put them on. You're listening to the Jolly Papa Show on WWD LP Tacoma Park. We've been playing music together for ages and uh, both playing different African music bands and know all the people in the African community. So we saw this as an opportunity to bring that community in. And, uh, you know, we get different voices in just to talk about what's going on in their, you know, how, what's their creative process, you know, um, you know what, what's their history, how did they get started playing music. And, you know, you just don't hear a lot of that. We have as much variety of people in the arts as we can find from the community. They come through and we have a discussion, you know, we find out a little bit about them from their bios and we get our own questions together and then, you know, try to have a short conversation. And, you know, we've been playing music together for ages and uh, both playing different African music bands and know all the people in the African community. So we saw this as an opportunity to bring that community in. Besides unique music, Tacoma Radio also provides a platform for diverse perspectives. Blair Jr.'s Ruby and Adelaide offer such a perspective through their show, Sugar and Spice. Sugar. Spice. And everything nice. Hi, you're listening to Sugar Spice and Everything Nice. On WOWD LP, Tacoma Park, 94.3 FM. Okay, I see this every week during the advice session. Oh, okay. Yeah, it comes up a lot. 
which is communication and self-love. Because that is the yeah. answer to all of the problems that we get on the show. I think Woman Week is a great Woman example. Woman Week is really good. We talk about like women. show because we talk. We play all lady songs. Yeah. Um, and we can talk about like women in the music industry. We can talk about our favorite female artists. Mm-hmm. We can talk about sexism. There's a huge variety of things. And we also try to have a teenage girl perspective because we think it's really mm-hmm. overlooked in the media or belittled when it is talked about. But we try to show that being a teenage girl is fun, but it's also sometimes serious and that there's certain things that we should talk about. And we might be a consumer market, but not for like anything that isn't materialistic. Sugar and Spice isn't the only student-run show in Tacoma Radio. Late on Friday nights, the hosts of Block Period use their show as an outlet to share their favorite music with the Tacoma Park community. It's just play music for about like uh, seven, eight minutes. We talk about the music that we just played. We like give our opinions some background and then just rinse and repeat. We come up with themes for the show during the week and we've done themes like anti-war, like dancing, like, I don't know, uh, like a classic rock night. We're like next to the dance studio. Like we were just talking to them after one of our shows because they're out pretty late too. And they were like, yeah, like you guys gotta play some dance hall music. And we're like, dang, like we should just have a dance hall night. We should just have you guys on the show. I learned a lot about dance hall that night, you know what I mean? And they were teaching us how to dance. They were just really inviting. I think the station is, is another way that this community, which is already pretty tight knit, can sort of, you know, bind itself together even more. And and also I think diversify the kind of the, the conversations that are being had. Tacoma Park is wonderfully diverse, but it's sort of balkanized. You know, there's there's the apartment buildings where folks are living and then there's the houses where folks are living. So the radio is an opportunity to, to bridge that a little bit. What we're trying to do is provide of a diversity or a wider range of available radio content for the DC area community. We're trying to promote, you know, inclusivity, diversity of folks and voices from the community so that the the content and the shows that are here are representative of the folks in the area. For any moment that I hear that someone listens to our show, like my mom will say that she ran into someone at the Farmer's Market or something that's like, um, is your daughter Spice from Sugar Spice and everything nice? Like, I just get so happy. Like, I'm actually known by people who I don't even know personally. Totally. It's nice to like, know that I'm broadcasting my voice out there. We are a, you know, a country of consumers. But here we have an opportunity where people are participating and putting in. And it's, they're not just consuming radio. They are engaging with radio. They're taking part with radio. They're working with us. And when I mean working with us, working with the communities.